Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Doing well on the, on the audio? Excellent. Uh, my name is Alexander Hoffman. I am the publisher of Field Mouse Press, a 501c3 nonprofit based in Grass Valley, California. And it is an absolute pleasure to sit down and talk with Maya Kobabe today. Maya is best known for her graphic memoir, Gender Queer, published in 2019 by Oni Press. Thank you. Yes, it is wonderful. Um, thank you, thank you. It's both, a, I think it's both a touching personal story, but then also a useful um, primer for people that are unaware or un, have questions about gender and gender identity. Mm -hmm. um, this book was awarded the 2020 um, ALA Alex Award, as well as the Stonewall Israel Fishman Award. Um, it's also one of the most challenged and banned books across the United States, both in local libraries and in school libraries. As conservative activists have targeted LGBTQ um, stories, it's been a kind of the focal point for a lot of the conversation um, about what it means to have free speech in the United States. Um, Maya's work has also been featured in the New York Times, on Slate, and in the Washington Post. Maya, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you, I'm excited. It's, yeah. This is a wonderful conversation. I'm excited for everyone to um, to get to learn a little bit more about your process, but I wanted to start really at the beginning um, of, the, the, of the conversation here by just addressing the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. which is the conversation around um, censorship. Yeah. So I, I, censorship is obviously a, a big concern for cartoonists. I think comics are uniquely vulnerable to uh, censorship because of the graphic nature yes. of them. You know, the image is such a big portion and parts of genderqueer that have been um, attacked or addressed in these censorship claims are the, the scene where, with the reads, uh, your discussion about uh, masturbation, the, the, the period blood, things mm -hmm. like that, um, that are just a, like a normal part of life, um, but um, have been kind of attacked as obscene. I think, your book is not the only book that's been challenged. No. You have unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, been the face of the book challenge. I think the number is something nearly 1,200 books in the last nine months have been challenged or banned in school and local libraries, mm -hmm. and over 800 authors have been affected by these bans. Um, that's all horrible, but I kind of want to know how has that affected your artistic practice, your mental health, mm -hmm. your position in, in this space? Yeah, we decided to talk about kind of book bans and challenges right off the top because I think it's, it's very current and fresh in people's minds and also then we could get past it and talk about more fun stuff after yeah. that. Um, but yeah, we wanted to start with this. Um, it's been so weird, um, specifically because you know, this book did come out in 2019, and then all of this media controversy started in late 2021. So to have so much media attention on a book that is not really a new release was unusual. And then, um, I don't know, I mean, I'm very aware that trans and queer material is frequently challenged, and I had another um, author who had read an early draft who I was in a writing group with, who has also had works be challenged, tell me on reading a draft, like this book will probably be challenged and take it as a compliment when that happens and also get to know the comic book legal defense fund now. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> those were very wise words that when the book indeed was challenged, I thought back to and I was like, he was right, he knew, he called it. Um, and this is Jimmy Robinson, um, who wrote Five Weapons among other series. Mm. Um, and so there, a little part of me was prepared. I mean, I braced myself a little bit when the book first came out. I was also in the middle of trying to work towards top surgery, but I did start seeing like a therapist a couple months before the book came out. And part of my thought in the back of my head was like, you know, if the shit hits the fan, let's have a working relationship with a therapist in place. Um, but then um, it was like a, much delayed after the release. So by that point, I had assumed that if there would be a challenge, it would have already happened. But then it, it did. I think the timing of it is what caught me by surprise, yeah. not that it happened at all. Um, and it has been stressful, and it has been time-consuming. I think is the big thing. There were various weeks in fall of last year, and then also spring of this year, where I was getting so many interview requests that I was like, I could. 
if I'm not careful, become a person who is a full-time like public speaker and has no time to write or draw, when what I want to be is an author who occasionally public speaks. I don't want to be just like a full-time public speaker. So like kind of trying to figure out how how much of this do I need to address personally? When is it important that I actually respond to an interview request? How much of it can I just ignore and just go along with yeah. my day? And actually, yes, keep sitting at my drawing desk and keep making new work instead of just keeping answering questions, often maybe the same questions kind of over and over about, you know, a book that I'm really proud of, but at this point came out like over like three years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the main thing has been, yeah, is, is thinking about how it affects my schedule and how it affects my time and whether or do I, do, when and when do I not need to speak to it? Absolutely. I think that's, it's a, it's a critical piece because in a, in a certain sense, you're doing the promotion of a work by saying, this is a thing that I'm proud of and this is what people need to know. But then also, you're an artist, not a marketer, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yes, my publisher has a publicity team um, and that's their job, not yeah. mine. <laughs> and that's the way it should be. Yes. Um, so I think, the, the next thing that kind of comes up for me is that um, we've recently got some great news out of the courts in Virginia. Yes. Um, so I wanted to bring that up. Um, uh, genderqueer was considered not obscene, and actually parts of the obscenity law in Virginia were struck down based yes, on... Yes, as unconstitutional. At, which yeah, is if people aren't... I didn't follow that. Yeah, thank you. It, it is very exciting, and I'm really glad. Um, yes, a lawsuit was brought by a... Um, a Republican from Virginia who was a congressional candidate but who actually um, did not win his congressional bid um, in the primaries in this, this past summer, he actually specifically sued a Barnes & Noble location for carrying genderqueer in another book, a het fairy tale fantasy romance um, by Sarah J. Mass, um, and claiming that the books were obscene for minors. And mm. I, th I, th I think that the goal was, or at least what he stated was that he wanted them to be, like you would have to, I guess, show ID maybe to yeah. buy them? Yeah, like, be over like buying or cigarettes. Something. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, but yes, the judge on August 30th um, dismissed the case on due process issues and also, yes, yeah, struck down part of the, the law that the case was based on um, in Virginia as being unconstitutional and violating the First Amendment. So that's really exciting. Well, we actually, the, in the end, the lawsuit, I think, maybe changed the law for the better. Yeah. So that's a... Uh, a win. Uh, so take that, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. now that we've we've addressed the elephant in the yeah. room, let's talk about something that's a little more fun, shall yeah. we? Yeah. All right. So <laughs> the first thing I wanted to oh, let's see if I can get the slide presentation to work. The first thing I wanted to talk about in terms of the book Gender Queer is how deeply personal and heartfelt it is and what it means to really, I guess, lay it all out there as an artist when you're making something, it's kind of a debut graphic novel, it's like, uh, but it's also a very intense personal statement. I wonder, um, how did you approach that initially? Yeah, I mean, this book is very interwoven with my own process of coming out, and this is a book that in the writing of it was very cathartic and very, um, useful and healing and it like the writing of it helped me reach conclusions that I don't know that I would have reached had I not spent so much time sitting over drafts and thinking about re trying to what am I trying to say in like the clearest most concise form and so I found the the process of writing it extremely like personally useful um, but there was also like a long time so I am in my early 30s and when I was a teenager in the early 2000s, there was so much less representation of trans and yeah. non-binary stories, so, stories in media, and I knew out gay, bi, and lesbian adults and older students, but I didn't meet someone who was out as trans or non-binary until I was in grad school. So as a teenager, I really had no model for that. I had no raw model for that. I didn't even really hear the word non-binary until I was probably in, like, in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, like, there were, then when I sort of finally did learn that word, there were many years where I was like, I think the idea of like coming out and yeah, being known and like telling people about like how, what my true like feelings about gender are is that is scarier and the scariness outweighs like my desire to be known. And it was like, I use a metaphor of a scale in here for gender, but there's another scale metaphor, which is like, which do I want more to be seen and recognized or to be like, or to not like speak up or like, you know, to like, do I want to be vulnerable or do I want to be known or do I want to be, feel safe but not recognized? And like these sort of like weighing of these questions for a long time, 
the like fear of coming out weighed heavier than the desire to be known. And yeah. at some point that shifted. And I was like, no, even though it's scary, I actually do want people to like recognize who I am and know who I am and know where I'm coming from when I talk about myself. And I think a tipping point was really realizing how the moving through a world in which people were reading my gender as one way, feminine, when that's not how I was reading myself or understanding myself was really damaging a lot of my relationships from like friendships to potential like romantic relationships. And I was like that mismatch of like not being seen as the way that I saw myself was leading to like miscommunications and just like misunderstandings. And it just made being in relation to people harder. And I was like, I want to be able to like know people and be known by people in a like deep and authentic way. So I think I'm gonna have to like come out about all of this. And because I'm a writer and an author and a cartoonist, one of the ways that I did that is by writing and drawing cartoons about it. Yeah, so absolutely, and then, and it kind of started as these black and white Instagram comics yeah. titled Gender Queer. Yes. I think. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you decided to use Instagram as a platform, and like what made you decide that like this is the project that I'm going to just serialize on Red Gold Sparks or like at yeah. Red Gold Sparks? <laughs> um, I think yeah, I think you have a slide of one of the earliest yes, ones. Yes, I do. If will, you click, I can find back. through it. Yes. Um, so yeah, this was one of the one of the early series. Really, what it was is when I sat down to start trying to write about like gender and gender identity. I, it felt very hard to write like the big picture, like here's what I mean when I'm talking about gender. It's a big topic. Um, and it, it was this almost feeling like, well maybe if I just write all of these little tiny comics that aren't trying to address the whole thing, but just one moment, one gendered moment, one memory, one interaction, one thought. Um, it was this feeling of like, well maybe if I draw enough individual little things, when I collect them all together, the bigger picture will start to emerge. And I felt in some way that I was like trying to like assemble a jigsaw puzzle, but I'd lost the top of the box, so I didn't know what the picture was. And I was like, I, maybe if I just create and piece together enough little things, like the bigger picture will start to emerge. And I was very influenced by a lot of other um, memoir cartoonists who draw in like a more simple or stripped down style of James Kachalka of American Elf. You can see I pretty much just ripped off the format that he uses with like a title at the top and the panels. And then um, Lucy. Uh, Nisley and Erica Moen and um, of course Alison Bechdel and like a lot of other cartoonists who kind of drew in like a very sort of simplified small character kind of style is like drawing on all of those influences um, and I didn't choose Instagram because I love Instagram that's for sure yes. um, it was more there was a year I started drawing these which was 2016 I sat down when I finally was like okay I'm gonna write about gender and I you know there's an anecdote at the beginning of this book where I was challenged to write about gender in like one of the very first classes I ever took in grad school and I was like absolutely not no thank you um, so about three years after that I was like okay I think we I think it's time I think we have to go back there reopen that box um, when I sat down to start writing it, they just like came flooding out. I drew like 60 of these little strips in like two weeks. And oh I was like, goodness. oh, I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> um, but of course, when I first drew them, I was like, oh, these are like wretchedly personal, wretchedly personal. And I was like, I don't know if anyone can see these. Um, and I had to first show them to like a slightly like widening circle of like, very like my sibling and my best friend and then like a slightly wider circle of friends from grad school and then other artists and writers that I really trusted to be like, are these good? Like, <laughs> first of all, are they working on the level of like narrative and, and illustration? And then also, do they change how you feel about me as a person? <laughs> and then at each level that I would share them, I would get like, you know, a wave of like love and support and, and feedback. Yeah. And then each time I got like a good response that sort of gave me more courage to share them more widely. And then I was like, well, I want to use these comics as a tool to like come out to my community, my professional community, which is cartoonists, people who are here, people in the audience, people who are tabling upstairs. And so I used the Inktober challenge in 2016 and I was like, I'm just going to post one a day. And because I am like forcing myself to post one a day, it means I can't like skip one of the ones that feels a little bit closer to home. But I do remember there was at least one comic that I posted at like two in the morning because I was like, maybe if I post it in the middle of the night, no one will read it, which is not how the internet works. Um, but it was, you know, it was one that just felt a little bit like, oh God, am I really posting this? Um, but so I think the one a day kind of did help me at least be like, okay, just have to release them, like get over your, your nervousness. Um, so that was kind of why I chose that venue was just really, it was convenience, and it was that was where a lot of my professional community was. So I was like, okay, if I post them here, a lot of people who make comics will will see them, and that will they'll do what I need it to do, which is to help me like kind of come out professionally. Absolutely, I think, yeah, you know, the, 
the whole um, the whole world on Instagram and social media has become so convoluted and kind of gross over the last yes. at least the last year or two yes. that it's it's one of those things I just like uh, do I have to be on you know this what's actually pretty great is Tumblr dot com yeah. anyone I, else I, here use tumblr dot com you still have um, an active tumblr I still have an active tumblr I have maintained an active tumblr since uh, 2011 so I can't leave now I live there yeah. um, <laughs> anyway and honestly in my opinion tumblr is the best social media for posting long form comics yes yeah, I agree because you can post images in a vertical scroll and um, it's way, it's way better than, in my opinion, than the little ten slides. There's still a ten image limit, but you can since you can post them a, like larger format, and it's easier to post links, links in the text of the post. And I don't need to be advertising a, a website. Anyway, I'm just saying um, that Tumblr is better than Instagram, and everybody should come back to Tumblr. I agree. <laughs> yeah. uh, th this has the Field Mouse Press stamp of approval. Yeah. I, I, it, yeah. It's, it's just so hard to yeah. really connect with people, uh, and I think. That's I, I I wanted to bring the idea of social media and connecting mm. up because I think that one of the things that I think genderqueer does so well mm. is connects your personal lived story to a broader audience, mm. people that may not have ever had the ability or understanding of um, non-binary gender mm. or even transgender or even those even mm -hmm. questions about like who am I, mm. what where is my place in the world. Um, and I was wondering, what um, what has the I mean, besides all the legal challenges and all that garbage, um, what has the response been in terms of other queer people coming to you and mm -hmm. saying your book helped me understand, or mm -hmm. what kind of reactions have you had in that way? So many and so powerful. Um, before I was drawing these little black and white comics and posting them, I'd been working on a long fantasy web series that. Uh, webcomic series that literally never gained any traction whatsoever and um, when I it was when I first started posting these comics that I like suddenly actually started getting like reader responses for like the first time and people would leave comments on them things like oh my gosh I didn't even know there was like a word for this yeah. or oh my gosh I thought I was the only person in the world who felt this way or like reading this makes me feel less alone. And then I started to have a lot of people come out to me, um, including people that I, you know, people who'd known, I'd known for years, like friends from like elementary school and like high school who I never would have guessed from just looking at them and the way they presented themselves in the world were questioning their gender. But, you know, they would read the comics and then they'd maybe, you know, DM me or something and say like, hey, I really relate to the stuff you've been posting and actually I've really been wrestling this as well. And that was like, felt like such an honor that people would then like trust me with that when yeah. clearly it was something they were not like, like super out about publicly. Um, and that meant a lot. Um, and yeah, and then of course, once the book has come out, I've had so many, so many readers reach out and say that it's, it's meant a lot to them saying things like, um, yeah, like I like if it's a young person saying like I gave this to my parents and they're now like better at using my pronouns or the reverse like a parent saying like thank you so much for this I feel like I understand my child better or like or my partner yeah. or my friend or whatever it is and um, partly because I did write the book in in huge part because like as a, a certain in a certain sense like a letter to my own parents and my own extended family and wanting to connect and explain to them so whenever people say that it like opened up those conversations in their family that specifically means like really a lot to me that's good yeah. i think i think that's one of those things where i think part of the joy that i have with your book is that is you know it's approaching some really complicated and difficult ideas about personhood and mm -hmm. self and the way we interact with the world and and you do it in such a kind of like just an open and clean way um, and, and what I mean clean is it's so clear and understandable mm. like the questions you're asking are hard but the way you ask them makes it easy mm. to um, to empathize and to come to an understanding I think that's one of the strengths of, of your work thank you for um, saying that but I also um, well I'm gonna skip this one but mm. I also think your uh, your short fiction and science fiction is actually quite good too. Thank um, you. So uh, Maya, um, this was in um, uh, this. These images are from a collection that was in uh, Spike Trotman. Yes, uh, yes, it's the Faster Than Light, y'all um, yes, anthology yeah. that came out from uh, Iron Circus Comics a couple of years ago. This is actually the longest. Um, is this still true? Yeah, the longest fiction comic that I've had yet published. It's 20 pages. I have it up on my table upstairs, wall 80. 
come visit me later. Um, and I'm really proud of it. Yeah, it's a story about um, two queer teens in high school trying to yeah build like a little spaceship engine together. And um, yeah, one of them's non-binary, and their teacher's also non-binary. But it's really about like like sort of like science and exploration, and, and like how ambitious of a project do you try to build when you're like you know like 17 years old or whatever. Um, and I I'm really happy. I'm really happy with it. And I really I love genre books. I love sci-fi and fantasy. It's probably what I read the most of, and I really, really want to um, publish more fiction work. My next book is fiction, but it's still contemporary. But I really like want to. I, I really want to draw my book with like dragons and spaceships in it here at some point. <laughs> like we're gonna get there yeah. eventually. Yeah, and eventually. I'm excited to read that. Yeah, book yeah, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Speaking of this new book, mm. do you, is there anything you'd like to tell the audience about what's what's on your plate right now? Yeah. Um, so my next book is still untitled. I'm. This one was easy to title, um, but I'm in general don't feel like I'm that good at titling things. I just sit, call it literally like whatever the most basic thing that it. Um, this is it is what it says on the tin. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I don't know what the title of the next one is, but um, we're in the mid process of selling it. It's pretty far along. I have a full script. I have a full thumbnail draft. It's currently 215 pages. That'll probably grow a little bit in the editorial process. Um, it is. Uh, fiction, contemporary, it is for a younger audience. It's sort of like middle grade or young YA. And it was written mostly based on like feedback I received when Gender Queer first came out from parents who would say, like, I read this and it was so useful, but my gender conforming, non conforming child is like 12 or 10 or 8 or 6, a little too young for this book. And I had a lot of parents ask me, you know, would you ever make an all ages version of Gender Queer? And I was like, I don't want to abridge my memoir. That feels weird. I don't want to do that. But I could write a new book that hopefully is addressing what you're asking me, which is I want a book about gender and identity and sexuality, but that is appropriate for a younger reader. Um, so that's kind of like what inspired me to want to work on the book. And yeah, it's about um, uh, a kiddo who's in junior high, 11 when the book starts, 12 by the end of the book. And you know, there's like gets their period and there's like the first sex ed classes and like some you know, like friendship stuff and like dating and peer pressure and coming of age and all those, all those good things from the morass that is junior high. Oh, oh. Those horrible junior. years. <laughs> Disgusting. Oh. Yeah. I'm just well, gonna wallow in those feelings while I draw this book for the next yeah. like two years. Yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, I think that, you know that that I think that strikes true for a lot of people in the audience. Junior high. Woof. Woof. Yeah. Woof is right. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think you could pay me enough. Like it'd be like a million dollars to go back and live through sixth and seventh grade again. I'd be like. Mm. Mm. No, I don't. I don't think I could take you up on that. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, I think this this idea of like genre and and fiction and your interaction with other media, mm -hmm. I think, is a really critical piece to bring up, too, because mm -hmm. one of the things that I really noticed in Genderqueer is the way that you engage with other media throughout mm -hmm. this book. And it really just shows, I think, your, your love for other art and yeah. the way that bleeds into your own creative process. Um, there's a there's this huge section, not huge, well, yeah, huge section in the middle uh, about your love for uh, genre fiction mm -hmm. and David Bowie mm -hmm. and um, various types of yeah music. queer YA yes, yeah, yes. yeah 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 boy and, bands mm -hmm. yes. yeah <laughs> and so I wanted to kind of get at that you know get at that question yeah. it's like how does how does your engagement with other arts like inform your practice so much I mean um, yeah I love reading and I love music and both of them are that's like what I'm just pouring into my brain like in all waking hours when I'm not pouring some stories out I'm pouring stories in um, yeah I I mean I think the reason that I wanted to become an author is because when I was like in high school and I was reading tons of different like fantasy and YA no novels, I noticed that a bunch of my favorite authors all seemed to thank each other in the acknowledgments. And sometimes they were each other's editors and sometimes they were married to each other. And I was like, it seems like authors know other authors. <laughs> and if I want to befriend my favorite authors, I think maybe if I become an author, that will be the shortest, <laughs> the quickest way. And so literally before I knew I had anything to say or even had a story that I felt worth telling, I was like, I want to become an author because I want in. I want in on that author friendship <laughs> stuff that's going on. Um, so like that was like the impulse was like this desire to like enter the literary space because I just wanted to like 
talk to people and hang with people and know people who are writing books. Um, and yeah, so there, there is a whole section here about yeah, like finding like the queer section of my local library and like how unbelievably like desperate I was for queer stories as a teenager. I would read anything. I was like hungry for the tiniest crumbs. And it's so amazing like now as an adult to be like, there are like just so many more queer books than there used to be and I am devouring them. Um, and then yeah, and then also music. So um, both my parents do love music a lot. My dad was a radio um, host through all of his college years. Hilariously, he was at um, San Luis Obispo at the same years as Weird Al Yankovic, and they both worked in the college radio. They overlapped for a couple of semesters, and they had wow. uh, they had a like back to back segments where like my dad's radio name was Babylon Bill, and it was like Weird Al and Babylon Bill, and it's like they someone at, at at the college like digitized those years, probably because Weird Al went on to become famous. So at one point, he was able to find in this like internet archive like these like clips from when he was a radio host as like a college student, and he played some for me, and I was like, this is wild um so anyway he loves music he also he plays many instruments and um he didn't during his time at the radio he just made a whole bunch of like he would um you know copy the albums they got in for the radio yeah. station he would just copy them onto cassettes tapes and he mm. had all these tapes and records and all of these things so like our house was just like full of all this bootleg music <laughs> when i was a kid <laughs> um so i got introduced to david bowie the stories in here through like a bootleg cassette tape that my dad had like dubbed and he had also it was mostly the changes album by david bowie but there was at least one song on there that he didn't like so he just swapped it out for like a song from ziggy stardust so the <laughs> album that i listened to as a teen was this like homemade album that like i love the set list of it so good like and it's like you know how you like anticipate the song that like when you listen to a whole album like what song comes after the next song and you're like yes I, this transition from the end of uh, you know of like this song into the next one is like so good and so like i can't reproduce that because let's i mean i guess i could like make a playlist on Spotify maybe, but I don't know, it wouldn't be the same. Anyway, um, but yeah, so tons of like music getting into my life through that method. And also, of course, because I spend a ton of my time just like drawing, I have so many hours in the day to listen to things. So yeah. I listen to tons of audiobooks, I listen to tons of podcasts, and I listen to a lot of music while I'm working. And so of course it like bleeds into my work because it's what's like coming in to my brain while other things are coming out of my brain. Like, yeah. of course it's gonna come like a soup. Yeah, of course. Well, of course. you know, it's like I, I always think about creativity kind of like as a pitcher full of water, right? Like mm. what you what you put into the pitcher mm. is what you're going to pour but, out. Of course. Yeah. Naturally. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think this is a perfect time to talk about K-pop. Oh, yes. Let's, Please. Let's do that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. Let's let me see if I can advance the slide. Yeah. K-pop in the time yeah. of COVID. Tell yeah. me about how so so I have to admit I was a K-pop novice mm. um, and then um, and then I was approached to see if I would be the moderator for this panel and I knew about this comic and I was like oh no yeah and you asked me for some playlists I did and, and I'm I was obsessed very... yes uh, oh. <laughs> so I'm like so I'm like I've infected someone <laughs> it's it is it is it is a disease I will gladly carry for the rest of my life um, I'm a carrier probably transmissible um, so. I think one of the things I wanted to ask is like, where did this get started? And mm. then also like, I think everybody has a story, right? Like we're, we're three years into this pandemic, right? Yes. And um, we're here at Small Press Expo mm -hmm. in person for mm -hmm. the first time since the COVID pandemic hit. And I am just like bubbling up with joy and to be in Mm -hmm. same room with people yeah. that do something that I really love and care about. Mm. Um, I think everybody has a story of how they survived. Like how did we, how did you get through? How what was it through? that got you through? So yes. I wanted to kind of hear about that from you because it sounds yeah. like K-pop K -pop was... was a big part of it. <laughs> a big part of it. Um, yeah. So people who read the book know that I had a pretty intense One Direction phase. Um, the band went on hiatus um, in 2016, <laughs> um, and so by 2017, I was like, I what? Can, I need something to be obsessed with. Like, I haven't had something to.
to be obsessed with for like a year. I'm dying. Give me something. I must hyperfixate. And just at that moment, a friend um, entered my life and who was already into K-pop, and we were talking about like music and pop music. And she was like, I mean, I, do you want to watch some K-pop music videos? It sounds like that might be up your alley. And I was like, yeah. And so she showed me a couple of music videos. The very first one ever was um, EXO's Coco Bop. If anyone has seen it, it's like a trippy brightly colored um, like acid trip of a music video. <laughs> Chef's kiss. So good. Um, and I was like, I'm obsessed already. Tell me everything. Um, so that was in like late 2017. And so for quite a long time, that was the one only K-pop group that I know and was into. And then when I ended up signing my book deal in um, January of 2018, I listened almost exclusively to K-pop while drawing genderqueer. And part of that is because I... Um, it's really useful for me to be into music that is not in English because I, um, I can listen to it while I'm writing and while I'm thumbnailing, whereas I cannot listen to music with English lyrics while I'm writing and thumbnailing because the words interfere with the words that I am trying to work with. But I can, so I also do listen to some Japanese music and like mm. Gaelic music and like folk music and like Enya, um, like anything that like, or I can't understand the lyrics is actually really great um, while I'm working. So I was like, this is great. This, it's this like poppy, upbeat, very bright, um, like, you know, quick tempo music that I can like put on this playlist and be like, yes, I'm like jazz to sit here and draw. But also the, like none of these words are distracting me and I'm just going to like draw, 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 draw. So like it was so great while I was working on this book. Um, and then, I, but, so I was, but I was like, I would say a casual fan. I would watch music videos and I would like listen to the music and I had some playlists, but I didn't like really know a lot of, I didn't really know about the industry and I wasn't yeah. like, learning all these members' names or I wasn't like watching interviews or anything. Um, and then, pandemic. Yeah. And as you know, we all experienced this. Everything that was on our calendars got canceled and there was like nothing going on. And I was like, what do I look forward to? What's gonna bring me joy? And the K-pop industry, um, most K-pop groups are managed by a company that um, does a lot of the production work. Some groups write their own lyrics and music, some groups don't. Um, but the release schedule is much more intense than what is normal for a Western or non-Korean group. They often release between one and three albums a year. And that means every album is gonna have a, a music video or a series of music videos and like a whole, you know, the whole release package, promo photos, interviews, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really great in those years where there was nothing on the calendar to be like, oh, what I can be excited about is that one of my favorite groups is putting on an album this month. So like on the 15th, I'll get like a new album and there'll be a music video and there'll probably be like a countdown to the release and maybe me and a couple friends will actually like get on a call together so we can like watch it at the same time and they'd be like, what did you think? And it just sort of like, it was something to be excited about. Yeah, It was something to have on the calendar, something to look forward to. And the K-pop industry also heavily um, invested in online concerts. Another great thing that you can do from your own home. So like during like the two years, I watched like 30 concerts wow. online from my bed in my pajamas at roughly like 20 bucks a piece. And then sometimes you could actually have two logins for one ticket price. So we'd split it with a friends. We're like, all right, yeah, for 10 bucks, we're going to like have a fun Saturday night where we're like, yeah, like probably like on a phone call and then also watching another laptop and be also texting a friend. And like, you know, it's this like simultaneous like experience of something exciting and new. And um, it just brought so much joy and excitement to my life. And yeah, and then I just had all so much time. So I really went down the rabbit hole of like almost every group also has a reality TV show Ooh. and interviews and goofy games and it's just hours of content, hour, hundreds of hours of content. So, um, so yeah, so I went from being someone who sort of casually listened to K-pop while I worked to someone who closely follows like 12 groups. <laughs> and um, this year alone, I have already in concert seen um, Monsta X, Stray Kids, twice. Seventeen, Epic High, CIX, and I have tickets to the Rose in November. And Ooh. I would see more if they would just simply come to the Bay Area. It's, they that, can take my dollars. <laughs> I will give them my dollars. <laughs> take my yes, money. Take please. my money, yeah. please. Yeah. So I think as a as a K-pop neophyte, I guess mm. as a as the new kid on the block, I'm just so obsessed with the idea of like how. Like just the whole, I just the whole production of it. Yeah. Like because it's so, it's so much. It's so much. <laughs> okay, this is like probably my favorite thing about K-pop and why I also love American pop music. I also saw Lady Gaga this year, and that was also great. Um, but the thing about K-pop is they take every type single thing that you can do and they push it to like the most intense extreme. So the costumes, they're the wackest costumes yeah. you've ever seen. The dances. 
beautiful, intense, complicated choreography. The background sets of the music videos, like movie level production, movie level CGI. And then, yeah, like the idols themselves, the funniest, weirdest, goofiest little friend group that you've ever seen. And normally like a group will all live in a dorm together. And like, I just, especially during the pandemic, you know, isolating in my own home, I was just watching the reality shows being like, all I want is to be living in a house with my five best friends, all working together on a shared creative goal, and like, with also the backing of a multi-million dollar company. Like, please, I want that. So like, part of it is, is like watching these things and being like, like, I wish I could be a K-pop idol, except that I don't want to sing and or dance or make music like that, but of comics? <laughs> Is that is, a thing? Is it is it too much to ask? Uh, is it I, too much to ask? It, I no, also would like a stylist crew, and I would like someone to like trim my hair every week and like tell me what color I should dye it, and like, like the fashion also is big gender. Let me tell you, in the fashion, um, and it also has like somewhat affected like how I like wanted to dress. Like I would look at different, you know, like looks and music videos and be like. Um, like I love like wow I would never have thought to pair like this type of thing with this type of thing or like they're doing something with makeup or something with earrings or something with accessories that I never would have thought of and it makes me want to be more bold in my fashion mm -hmm. as well and so I did also while I also was heavily missing my thrift stores during the pandemic as well I started like shopping on like on Poshmark and other like online resale stores and being like all right what's the k-popest thing I can find in this <laughs> online <laughs> resale store um and yeah and I, I feel like I wear more like bright colors now mm. and I, yeah, I have started tiptoeing into makeup which is something that I felt completely unaccessible and like um, just like bad gender to me um, before I was out and just like yeah it just makes me want to be like be yeah I just just be the k-pop idol you want to see in your own life you know <laughs> and it's like I mean it kind of mentioned in genderqueer like the aesthetic that I've always dreamed of is this like elf fairy gay glam wizard space prince um is like the like vibe i want to be putting out and a lot of k-pop is is that is that is, is that. exactly that yes is ex exactly that. yes yeah. even like like one direction was like a taste and k-pop is like here's the whole cake yeah okay. that was a, like a muffin and the this is appetizer a cake. yeah yes. one direction is the Ugh, appetizer for yes. the full meal yeah absolutely yeah wonderful yeah um i and I think one of the things that I think that kind of like brings up in my mind is this idea of um, like having things to, I guess, to latch onto. Mm. Um, and I think that kind of brings me back around to writing and mm. cre the creative act. Do you think that there are things like that that you're focused on when you're creating something new or when you're working on the next book, the next thing? What's are there things like that that you kind of gravitate to or fixate on? Yeah, I mean, I feel like ev yeah, everything, like we mentioned earlier, like everything you put into your brain ends up getting like thrown into the mix of something that's going to probably end up coming out again in, in a different version. And I, so the, the next book that I'm working on that has doesn't have a title yet um, was written mostly in 2020 and 2021. And that one is, yeah, very much like, sort of like reflecting on early feedback to genderqueer and my own like junior high years. So that one is more like I do, the characters in it are obsessed with a book series, which is kind of, it's more closely similar to like, I, it's sort of like a red wall esque. It's like animal oh. warrior, you know, like squirrels with swords, that kind of thing. Oh um, because yeah, I was very into like red wall and like what the, like the, yeah, like books like that where we're like animal protagonists who were yes. like fighting noble battles in castles. Um, that was very into that when I was like 12. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make up a fictional squirrel sword series for my main character to be into. I feel that on an yeah, emotional yeah, yeah. level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. and it's, I think, and I mean, any book that I would write, probably in any setting, but specifically in a contemporary setting, I feel like the characters have to be into some kind of media because, I mean, at least that's how I feel because I was like, my, yeah, my whole life has been shaped by like the media that I've been yeah. into and like I can define different eras of my life by like, yeah, like these were the Harry Potter years. These were the Lord of the Rings years. This is when I was really obsessed with BBC Sherlock. Like yeah. this, here, and then here was Merlin and then it was One Direction. And it's just like, it is the waves of my life and it's like, it's brought me so much joy and I've also like, it, I've made a lot of friends through fandom. Yeah. Um, I've made a lot of friends, including people who I met online, who I then was able to transition into like IRL friends. Like when I was this summer driving down to Los Angeles, road tripping to Los Angeles to see Stray Kids in LA and staying in a, in a Airbnb, I looked around the car and I was like, oh, I'm in a car with three people who I met on the internet 
through K-pop who I would not have known otherwise. And now we are close enough friends that we are going on a three day road trip together. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, how great is that? Like when people are always like, how do you make friends as an adult? I'm like, be really obsessed with a media property I, and be willing to chat with strangers online. I don't know. <laughs> that that yeah. worked for me too. Yeah, I, yeah. The people that I, I make comic books with, uh, we are all comics critics first. And so yeah. it's all, it was, it started as this idea of like, well, this, I really respect this person's ideas about comics. Let's, ch I'm going to send, I'm going to send them an email and see yeah. what happens. Yes. Yeah, send like, that email. Yeah. yeah you should do that. Yes. Send an email yes. to the person that you secretly admire. Yeah. It will, it will go well for you. I yeah. Promise. I mean, yeah. well, especially again, leaning back to what I was saying about when as a teenager, I was like, I got to befriend authors. I got to find an author. I said that, I mean, I said it a little facetiously, but I'm genuinely really serious. Like if you love a type of art, making a sort of like your own spin on whatever that type of art is from straight up just fan art to like my your own original series but in the same genre and then if you are able to like yeah go up to a creator in whatever genre that you admire and be like i love your stories or your music or your podcast or whatever it is like thank you so much for your work here's one of mine and like give you know like and then maybe like here's a link to my podcast or my web series or like you know here's my self-published comic and like this is a really good place to do that a place like yeah. like i literally i've already done my first art trade upstairs, which yeah. was someone who came up and was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm not published, but like, I just, you know, put out the first chapter and I'm like, well, if you got it in your bag, like, let's, I want one, yeah. please, <laughs> you know? And, um, yeah, like I, I do think, and it's just, it's such a good way to get to know someone is by consuming their art, especially like writing, because it lets you know what they care about and what they right. think about and like what's important to them. And like the, the questions that are, that they're the big questions that they're concerned about. Mm -hmm. Um, I really do think that it's like one of the best ways to get to know people is by like, yeah, reading their work. And then if you want also to be known, it's like to share your work as well. Like, yeah, that's where it's at. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think being able to, you know, I think for me it was, it started with writing what I, what I, what I thought about specific comics. Mm. And, um, I remember reaching out to a few different people, Bridget Alverson, Kate Dacey, uh, you know, and saying, uh, I'm new at this and what do you think? Mm. And getting all this really positive feedback yeah. and saying like, you can do this. You are, yeah. you are qualified to, to, to write. Um, and that launched me on this whole path into comics in a way that now is completely irreversible um, <laughs> in a wonderful way. Uh, yeah, and you're and now you are a publisher and you are publishing someone who yeah. I mentioned in my book. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah you, so, you type that. It's exciting. Oh yeah, so uh, we just announced a new book with Mari Naomi, mm -hmm. um, who is in the first couple pages of Gender Queer. Yes. Um, Mari's one of my favorite cartoonists, um, and so we recently acquired um, their gar uh, their graphic memoir. I thought you. Loved me, mm. um, 320 pages. Uh, where it's on Crowdfunder now. So if you are Ooh. interested, um, check that out. Uh, we we got away from Kickstarter because of like the Web 3.0 stuff, like the NFTs. And yeah, we're, we're not yeah. into burning down the planet. Yeah, so let's not do that. We. I, we do like books, yeah. though, so you, yeah. <laughs> you, do have, you do have to kill some trees to make some books, but uh, we, yeah. we try not to do the other stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's enough about me. Um, let's. I wanted to chat a little bit about... I, I, I've, I'm always like, okay, question. Um, favorite pairing in Lord of the Rings? Um, okay, well, I mean, obviously... Frodo and Sam are in a relationship. Yeah, that's. I think the relationship. I think that's just canonic, canonical. Yeah, that's just canon. Yeah. I do <laughs> like really like reading Frodo as an asexual character. Um, I, in general, like looking at properties and deciding this character, based on no evidence of the author saying this character is trans, um, or this character is ace, or like whatever it is, and like head canon accepted. I actually think, yeah, I mean, why not, why, why not read Frodo as an ace trans man? And Sam is his like super supportive bestie and they are platonic life partners. And probably once Sam gets married, you know, Frodo is like the third parent to his kids yes. probably, yes. um, until he goes on his the, the later part of his journey. But like, yeah, I mean, like, I feel like the funnest thing is just to look at media and be like, where are the 
the queer trans found families in this story and some stories just hand it to you on a platter like things like our flags mean death it's just like oh this whole crew is just a weirdo found family of like queer oddballs that's great but then also older stories that don't give it to you as explicitly like you can just decide yeah you can look at a book and decide every single character is in there is trans and it's just not mentioned because it's not relevant to the plot but they are it, they it, are. As long as it makes your experience better, that's what yeah. matters, right? Yeah. And you know, it's like, and I, growing up, I, I think we probably had similar, um, similar like desires for the sim- type of fiction, like mm. Mercedes Lackey. Yes, and, oh, I read a lot of her. Um, yeah. And so, like, just that kind of, just like hunting for something mm-hmm. where you can, you know, find yourself. Yeah. Um, and now, now you're in the maybe enviable position of being that person now, mm-hmm. like. Um, what has been um, one of the things that you've taken most from your audience or, or reader interactions? Like, from a, I, we've talked about this a little mm. bit, but I wanted to kind of dig into like, what do you think you've gained from those conversations? Well, I mean, every single time a reader tells me I related to this book and it made me feel less alone. That also means that I, as the author, am less alone in my yeah. own experience. I so every that. time I hear that, it means like I am part of like a wider and wider and more and more like vibrant and diverse and creative like community. So it's also like very exciting for me to hear people say I related to this because then it's like, well then like we are there is something then we are siblings in some way like there is something between us that is really resonant and like that's an absolute delight and it's also so cool when people who are on like unlike the younger side of my readership so like maybe they're still in high school you know pick up the book and they're like oh I love this and like yeah I've been using non-binary pronouns since I was like 13 and I'm like I didn't even know what non-binary pronouns were until I was 23 so you're like you're a real head <laughs> ahead of me and then it just makes me wonder like what kind of book will the teens who are reading Genderqueer and the other stuff that's out now, like what kind of books are they going to be writing in their 30s? I literally cannot wait to find out because they're going to be like even like queerer than maybe anything I could come up with, which is going to be very exciting. And I will happily, I'm like, I'm so excited for like, the, yeah, the, the, the next couple waves of like queer books that are going to be coming out of people who, who like read this stuff when yeah. they were young. Absolutely. And part of it is like I was able to meet Um, One of my favorite, um, uh, a favorite author of my teen years, David Levithan, people, maybe he wrote um, Boy Meets Boy and uh, The Realm of Possibility, many, many books. One of his books, uh, Boy Meets Boy, came out, I think, about 2003, so I was like a eighth grader, um, and it was one of the first queer YA books that had like a genuinely just like happy ending, like a just a like, rom-com that didn't end with a character getting kicked out of their home or a character um, dying or something really sad happening. It just was like a joyful, light book. And I was able to meet him at the um, American Library Association conference that I went to in DC earlier this year. And yeah, it was this moment where I was like, he, you know, he wrote that when he was in his 20s. Yeah. <laughs> and like for me to be able to like, yeah, I read that when I was 13 and I wrote this and for me to be like, I can't wait for the, I'm on the other side of the table where someone comes up to me and is like, I read this when I was 13 and I wrote this. And I'm just like, yes, like, ah, oh, I can't wait for that. So yeah, I'm really that excited. Amazing. Yeah. I think this would be a wonderful time to kind of, oh, I've mm-hmm. already advanced this all the way through the end of the slide. Okay. That's um, it. That's all th- that's I wrote. It, that is, that's all, of it. That's <laughs> all I wrote. I think now would be a wonderful time to open it up to some audience questions okay. if we have any. Um, yeah. And we've got um, microphones in the back on either side. Oh, so perfect. If, yeah. So um, if, if you have any questions. Yeah, I guess, yeah, head to one of those two mics on either side of in the aisles if you have a question. And if not, we're just going to keep chit chatting. I'm going to start just asking what your favorite music video was or something. Oh, kind of no. not that interesting to the audience. You can't ask that question. There's too many. <laughs> um, hello. Hello. Um, I was wondering, as there's been a few years now since your memoir debuted, if there's anything that you've reprocessed or feel different about now that you might readdress in the future? Mm, That's a great question. Um, I think there is a scene where I talk about a book that I'd read, um, uh, which is called uh, Touching a Nerve, The Self as Brain, an interview with uh, Patricia Churchland. This is the part that I worry is going to become out of date the fastest. Partly because, specifically, this the book that I mentioned was published in 2013, so almost 
10 years ago at this point. Um, and when I read this book, which was in maybe 2018, um, I found it really meaningful and it really did help me feel comfortable in myself. Um, that being said, the, the, um, so the field of neuroscience is such a quickly developing field and the sort of understanding of how um, hormones do impact like the growth of like a fetus in the womb, et cetera. It's just like, I feel like we are understanding new things about it. Like literally every year a new paper comes out. And so I think this section, I don't regret including it because like I said, it's something that helped me a lot at the time, but I do think looking at it, I'm like in like 10 to 15 years, this, this couple pages may feel like super dated. So, yeah, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Everything ages, yeah. including us. But, so, but I mean, I think it's also like it, it's your story, right? It's yeah. at, at the time when at you were At the time reading, I read it and it was meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. And that part won't change. The fact that it was meaningful to me in the past, like that's not going to change. It's just that I'm like, we, yeah, there's probably already new neuroscience that is like more clearly explaining this than what this book did. Yeah. Thank you. Good Thank question. You. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Make, make, make your way. Make, make way, make way. Yeah. <laughs> friends over here. Um, I was curious um, if you have any advice for people who want to write about themselves, um, mm -hmm. especially in like a nonfiction way that maybe don't feel ready or like they're, they know where their story's going yet. That's a really good question. And yes, I mean, one answer is just sometimes you just have to live until the time is right. And like, that's why there's the anecdote at the beginning of this book where I tried to write about gender and that scene is set in 2013. And I was like, nope, not now, not now. And I think it was, yeah, I hadn't thought about it enough. I hadn't processed it enough. I hadn't had enough like really good meaty conversations with other trans and non-binary people to help me sort of understand what I wanted to say and where I was coming from. And I, it was you know, three more years later in 2016 where I finally was like, okay, now is the time that I'm ready to write about this. And then I did the whole black and white series. And then it was in 2018 that I was like, okay, now I'm gonna try to turn this into a book. And there was a lot of editing and drafting. And I did look at some of those old black and white comics from even just two years prior and was like, this already doesn't feel true anymore. Or like this, this already doesn't feel like the best way to say this. Um, and yeah, so, I think also when you sit down to write a memoir, ideally the process of doing it should feel good. Like it should feel like you are working through things and processing them and maybe even doing a little bit of healing. Um, and if it feels like you are pulling a scab off of a wound and you're like, it feels, it hurts. Like if you're not enjoying the process of reliving these memories, that probably means that you're not quite ready to write about that topic yet. Yeah. Um, but definitely keep going. I find journaling really useful. I try to journal really regularly. I try to keep notes on anything that happens. I also, at this point, if I go somewhere that's a scene that I think might turn into a scene into a future Jenna Crew sequel, I take a bunch of reference photos. <laughs> um, and I'm like, please might need these later. Just take these now. Um, and I would say, like, do that, the gathering of sort of what I would call the primary source material of your own life. Like, even if you're like, I can't write about this yet but you can take notes and you can prepare yourself for like a future in which you can write about it. So I would just say like, keep thinking on it, keep noodling it, um, keep just having conversations about it with other, with friends, with other creative people. Mm -hmm. And hopefully when the time is right, the work will let you know. It'll sort of, it'll start knocking like on the door and you will be ready to open it. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things I love about that that response is that there's so much doing. There's so much, mm. it's not, you're not waiting for the inspiration to strike. Yeah. You are, you're actively preparing. One of the yeah. things I think is really helpful in many art practices or in my, my own uh, creative and uh, work is to let my subconscious mind kind of like work on a thing. Yeah. Like think about the problem and then just ignore it. Yeah. And then let the, the back end of your brain kind of figure that yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds like you're in, in, by doing, in the process of doing, you're kind of getting at that. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah, it's Look, very active. It looks Hello. like we've got another question. Hi, yeah. Um, when you're writing a story that's so personal to yourself, it's, I, I guess it's, it's hard not to bring in other people from your life as part mm. of that story. Um, I guess what is, part of your process, how, like, how did you handle that when you know that stories that maybe other people 
potential names or people that if the name wasn't the same, they would they would know. Mm -hmm. how, how did you kind of how do, how do you handle that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, that's a really good question. It was very important to me that I be really care handle other people's parts of this story carefully because I wanted this to be a book that built bridges, not burned them. So every single person who appears in this book, I showed them the draft of the pages that they are on. Um, I, I asked every single person, do you want to be known by your real name or would you like me to change your name or maybe not use any name for you? And I had that conversation with like loads of people. And um, I would let people, especially who are in more scenes, like read them and give me some feedback, including things, you know, some people, um, I think there was at least one scene where my mom said, like, I, that's not quite how I remember it. Or, like, I remember saying something more like this. Or, like, I had one other scene where a friend said, like, you've drawn me. It looks like I'm kind of, like, angry or irate. But what I remember is just being, like, confused. So could you maybe just, like, change my facial expression a little bit? Which I was, like, easily done. I just, The eyebrows were tipped like this a little bit. I just tip them up like this. It's, like, two, two lines. It's such an easy change. But, like, that kind of thing. So I really didn't want anyone to be surprised. Like, I really wanted people to be completely aware of what I was working on and what I was writing and what I was saying so that nobody would be shocked when the book came out. So um, my parents in particular, my mom read the book at like the pencil stage and then I think she read it again at like the ink stage. My dad actually did not read the whole book before it came out because he kept saying like, I just want to wait till it comes out. But I made him read yeah, every scene that he was in and he caught two factual errors um, that I, I'd said he had become an Eagle Scout but he actually only reached the level right below Eagle Scout which is... Uh -huh. Joy Scout or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, so I was like, okay. So I fixed that. And like, you know, just like little things. So um, I do think that it is very important to be, yeah, to be mindful of that. And like, there are some scenes in here that are probably relevant to the story that I didn't include if it felt like that is too much someone else's story and not mine. Um, one of the challenges of it is that there were at least one friend from high school that I like really didn't speak to anymore when this book came out and kind of navigating around like, all right, well, I don't want to like completely admit this person, but I also don't want to include them very much because that's the person who's like not really in my life. So kind of just, just being thoughtful about it. And I think, I think just, just having a level of care and checking in with people that you can, you can do a good job. Absolutely. Well, everyone, Maya Kobe. <laughs> Thank you for coming.